This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Hi everyone, it's me, former TV and radio star Tom Bollard. <laughs> Did they say you were a former star? At least you're a star yes. at all. I'm not a star at all. I'm an activist apparently, which is probably generous. But I'm still a star, bitch. I am still mm-hmm. a star in theory with some tangential relationship I, to TV and radio. You are but according a TV to news. Star. I guess that's true. I've been you on TV for fucking star- ages. Yeah, well wait, but oh your little series doesn't count as TV, does it? Well, it kind of does, but I was a supporting mm. role. I'm not on there every week. I think you're a star. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Former Triple J presenter recalls absolute rage seeing Aussie woman celebrate voice referendum loss. This was doing the rounds of the, in the wonderful establishment that is news.com.au where journalism yeah. goes to die. Mm. A former TV and radio star has revealed the reaction that filled him with absolute rage inside a pub moments after the voice to parliament was rejected. ABC <laughs> star, star, again, haven't worked there for fucking five years. ABC star Tom Bollard. <laughs> Also, this, okay, so it said ABC star Tom Bollard has unleashed at a woman he met in a pub, which makes you sound quite violent. Yeah, real bad. (laughs) You unleashed at a woman you met in a pub who voted no in the voice referendum, saying her position caused him, quote, absolute rage, which is not, no, like her position, as I understand it, it's not necessarily her position. It was the fact that she heard the yes result and was like, Big smile, thumbs up. Oh, the, the no result, sorry. But apparently the what, they've edited the article? Did you complain, Tom? Look, I did, actually. I went through my little <laughs> management. I've, I've went to the fight for the little guy, by that I mean me, and all the other <laughs> ABC stars out there. Mm, someone's got to do it. Because, like, yeah, this was a big write-up. Again, a classic journalism piece now. Journalism now is just, I listen to a podcast. Here's what these people said. But, you know, I was getting a bunch of- I hate of- to tell you, but I don't think they listened to the podcast. I think they saw the TikTok. Or well, the yes, real. yes, I saw the yeah. one clip, I suppose. Yes, we probably mm. didn't. Oh, no, there were, there were no, there were quotes in the article that were from other parts of the conversation. Oh, really? So, oh. Yeah, yeah, they did. Hello, news.com.au. Indeed, Thank you for yes. listening. Thanks for subscribing. Become a patron <laughs> at patreon.com forward slash serious day. Throw us three bucks a month for your trouble. But I was getting- I was getting a bunch of comments and stuff from fuckheads who would hate us anyway, of course, and who are very yeah. happy no voters and celebrating, you know, another setback in First Nations justice in this country and clearly love the fact that woke little fuckheads like us were sad. But I was just like, look, let's just stick to the truth, okay? And that mm. that representation in that text does sound like I went up to a woman in a pub yeah. and yelled in her face for- Because she voted no. Because she voted no, which is just simply not true. Yeah. So it did change. And then they kind of like got on board with us a bit. They're like, former ABC <laughs> presenter Tom Ballard has recalled the absolute rage he felt seeing a no voter's bizarre reaction to the Which voice referendum's was. defeat bizarre. at the weekend. I yeah, guess that is it's funny. I mean, I because we posted, that was one of the clips from last week's show that we posted on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter. All of which you can follow us at Serious Danger AU. <laughs> um, but the I I don't usually like I haven't read all the comments, but it's literally still like almost a week later, still going off. People really do be in the comments, and it is a depressing. I know it's not a genuine reflection necessarily of Australian society or even of all the people who voted no. But I have found it somewhat interesting if I can detach myself from how bleak it all is, just to see the arguments that people are making really to themselves for why they voted mm. no. Uh, right. And they're just letting them all out in the comments section on that video. But it, it's so funny because, yeah, it's just they assume so many things that are incorrect that they're, you know, that both of us were like uncritical yes voters, that the podcast was like, yes, you know, the yes campaign and anyone who who thinks no is a is a terrible racist the whole way through. And I'm like, yeah, it's funny that we actually spent quite a few episodes discussing a critical no vote and like why we would reluctantly vote yes, probably more so in my case than yours. And that the point of even the discussion that that clip was of was like understanding the antipathy and the kind of disillusionment that and the anti politics that would like contribute to a no vote and how people might be, yeah, taking that out in the referendum, but completely flattened. Because it just becomes like you're calling me a racist and, 
you are just an inner city lefty and yeah it's almost like social media doesn't allow for nuanced and engaging conversations about the state of the country. That's why we have country. podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'd go so far as to describe it as anti-social media, but that's just me. Whoa. You should put that on a shirt. <laughs> Talk about the Greens. That funny, that bunch of idiots. If you want the dole for life, free marijuana, vote Greens. And particularly shame on the Greens. They always want to take our water. <laughs> order. We're stuck with the hosts of Chapo Shithouse Podcasts. Speaking of podcasts, this is one. It's about green politics in Australia and it's called Serious Danger. Hi, I'm Emerald Moon and that's Tom Bower, a bollard. Hello. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, Tammy, I'm Tammy Billards. I'm Hello. Tim, I'm Timothy Billy. Uh, this is not an official Greens Party podcast. It is made possible with the help of the Green Institute and produced by Michael the Griff Griffin. Everyone send Michael the Griff Griffin some love this week. He's a little sick. He has a cold and he's still doing the podcast for us. We love the Griff. Uh, there is a pretty clear situation uh, happening in the world, which is the horrific situation in Gaza and its international and domestic implications are what we will be discussing this week. But we want to give you a little treat at the end of the episode. <laughs> Life is just fucking bleak at the moment, I feel, and there is a glimmer of hope over the ditch in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We were able to net Chloe Swarbrick for an interview fucking finally. I was very nervous, but <laughs> we talked about the recent wins that the Greens have had there. She's got a bunch of new friends in Parliament and she was generous enough to join us for a chat, even though it felt like she was like constantly looking at the door as though someone was like going to come and be like, Chloe, we need you at the press conference. <laughs> uh, but yeah, <laughs> we put that an interview at the end of the show to look forward to. Something we didn't quite get to, which I just think is worth pointing out. I didn't follow the election very closely. The one clip that did sort of come into my life was from the leaders debate between the two leaders of Labor and the Nationals in New Zealand. Both of them are named Chris, both white guys named Chris, of course. <laughs> and just this, like, they're just the same dude. And, you know, we talk about, oh, you can't tell the difference between the major parties anymore. Mm. There's literally two white guys named Chris who agree with each other on cannabis, on Republic, on housing policy. They both pretty much seem to have lived the, exactly the same fucking life and they wow. are just the same dude. Very so sad. Choices. Very mm. bleak. But hey, you know what's not bleak? Subscribing to the Serious Danger Patreon for just three bucks a month and getting access to exclusive bonus content, cool stuff, and helping make the show continue to happen. Pay our producer, Mike the Griff Griffin. Thanks to our new patrons, Robin, Daniel, Martin, Aiden, Joshua, and Al. And shout out to Karen, who doubled their pledge. Thank you, Karen. Very nice of you. In this economy. Thanks, Karen. Before we jump into the bleakness too, here is some other exciting news. This is episode, what is this? This is 97? 96. 96. This is episode yeah, 96, 96. Which means we're very, very close to getting into to triple digits, number, baby. 100. I wonder if we should do something to celebrate our 100th episode. What do you think, Tom? I agree. I agree with you. You should stop wondering because we're doing it. We discussed this before we started recording, so I don't know why you're <laughs> playing this weird game. We are doing a live show to celebrate our 100th episode, and it's going to be fucking rad. It is going to be happening in Melbourne at the Comedy Republic on Burke Street, an amazing comedy venue and a wonderful place for people to come and laugh and think. It is happening on Saturday, I don't know, Saturday, November 18th at 5 p.m. Special guests, TVA. <laughs> we've, they're we've secured gonna TVA. be good though you like... have no idea how good and special these guests are going to be you're not even fucking oh. ready so make sure you get your tickets they are $25 they're on sale now comedyrepublic.com.au we'll put the link in the show notes um, and you know the money will go back into helping pay Mike and make the show happen and I think it'll be fucking fun and Tom you know has convinced me to to leave Greensland and, and come to Melbourne. So you better make it worth my fucking while. Come and oh, tell me I'm the funny one. <laughs> what a fucking threat. Um, <laughs> Buy tickets. We love doing this show. We love the people who listen to the show. And, yeah, celebrating 100 episodes live on stage in Melbourne will be a treat. So, yes, come along. We'll put a link to the show notes, of course, but comedyrepublic.com.au is the place to go. Thank you for the call to the member for Griffith. 
Thanks, Mr. Speaker. If our goal is peace and a good life for all Palestinians and Israelis, and I think it should be, then we should be honest and clear-eyed about how to stop this violence. If we are horrified by the murder of innocent Israelis by Hamas and condemn, rightly condemn Hamas, horrified by the murder of innocent Palestinian civilians, outraged by Islam, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, and I certainly am, then we must do everything we can, can to stop what risks becoming a, a full-blown genocide carried out by the Israeli government and military in Gaza on Palestinians. We must. We must, push for, we must push for an Order. end to the Israeli occupation of Palestine, illegal, se illegal settlements Bowman. and blockade of Gaza. David Cameron, yeah, said all the the way back in David Cameron said all the way back in 2010, everybody knows what we are going, that we are not going to sort out the problem of the Middle East peace process while there is effectively a giant open prison in Gaza. For 16 long years, the 2.3 million Palestinians have lived under a brutal blockade without, without, with limited access to food, water, construction materials and medical supplies. Palestinians in Gaza have had the to apply for, for permits. The member, Just, for, Mr. The member Speaker. for Bowman, the member for Griffith will resume his seat. The member for Bowman will leave the chamber under 94A. This week we have seen the State of Israel wage an all-out war on Gaza and the Palestinian people, committing an absolute bonanza of war crimes, all of it unquestionably supported by the West, including our country, Australia, which always stands up for the, for the rights and the good things. Mm -hmm. It is, as I, look, even obviously everyone listening to this podcast is vaguely across the news in some way. It's a truly horrific situation and... All signs indicate to it becoming even worse uh, yeah. in the next little while. I'll Quite give a brief. Uh, even yeah, in in between the time that we've recorded this episode on Friday morning and when it is released. Totally yes, yes. We're recording this Friday morning. Things may have changed, um, and we keep that in mind. And we won't spend too much time on these details because I'm sure they've been pouring into your ears and your hearts and making you very sad. But it is important to get just the basic overview. Gaza health officials estimate at least 3,700 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza since October the 7th. A third of those deaths have been children. That amounts to a Gazan child being killed by the Israeli military every 15 minutes. Reports of 12,000 people injured. And again, it's very hard to get your head around just the level of bombardment, the intensity of these kind of strikes. Okay, thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of bombs are being dropped in one of the most densely populated areas on earth. Mm -hmm. Israel has dropped more bombs on Gaza this past week than the US dropped on Afghanistan in its first year of its occupation in 2001. The yeah, Economist that's... has reported that as many as one in 20 buildings have been destroyed. Uh, the reports that Israeli airstrikes have been deliberately targeting bakeries to make it even harder for Gazans to access or make food. I was hearing also I think the last uh, bakery in Gaza has now been destroyed. It's already extremely hard for Gazans to access any food, of course, because Israel has imposed a complete siege on Gaza, cutting off all food, water, fuel, electricity, and medical supplies to all these people who were already trapped in what was effectively mm -hmm. an open-air prison. Mm -hmm. We know those supplies are running out. They're running out very fast. Thousands of people are being killed by bombs. Many more could die through hunger and through thirst or lack of medical attention and a lack of medical supplies. At the time of recording, there are stories about there seems to be some kind of progress. There seems to be a, an agreement to let some aid trucks into Gaza to provide material support to people. I think it's about 20 trucks or something. Of course, that's nowhere yeah. near enough. Um, yeah. NGOs are estimating hundreds of thousands of people trapped and being terrorised would need, like, need something like 100 trucks a day in order to Yeah, people. imagine if you, what, you've got like millions of people, 20 trucks of aid, just yeah. the maths, it doesn't add up. Does not make sense at all. There, are, yeah, two point two million people in Gaza before this um, attack began, and some people have managed to leave and have moved around in different parts of Gaza. But yes, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in desperate need. On top of all this, further violence is threatening to break out across the region. That we've already had bombings in Lebanon as well, and conflict mm. with Hezbollah and Israel, and increased violence and persecution in the West Bank of Palestinians too, where Hamas doesn't exist, by the way. Of course, the whole yeah. problem is Hamas, but hey, what do you know? In the mm. West Bank where Hamas isn't operating, uh, Palestinians are still living under occupation and persecuted and vilified and the victims of violence. Mm. And while Israel prepares its forces for a land invasion, again, that may have already moved or happened in between us recording and you hearing this, 
we're hearing from multiple Israeli ministers and high-ranking diplomats making statements about their attitudes towards Palestinian people, which can be described without exaggeration as genocidal. We've had Mm -hmm. high-ranking officials sort of saying, describing the people of Gaza as human animals and that they need to be wiped out. The only way to to defeat Hamas Hamas is to wipe out Gaza itself. Yeah. Um, So no good is my basic summary. (laughs) Your assessment? Yeah, for or against? Not into it. Yeah. What have you been thinking and feeling while you've been watching all this stuff play out over this past weekend? Uh, It's hard to, like, I admit that I I consciously disengaged or take moments to disengage and then I Mm. kind of, I start reading uh, and I feel the tears (laughs) coming Mm. and then I'm like, oh, you're going to cry, are you? Like, you're going to cry in your safe little city in fucking Brisbane. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, there, particularly, you know, Palestinian diaspora and I mean, people in Gaza um, and the, the Jewish community as well, you know, are in fear for their lives or their families' lives, uh, have lost loved ones. I mean, just to, to watch and, yeah, I think particularly for, for Palestinians and for people who have family in Gaza now to be seeing the, the threats of, yeah, what I, you know, what I would say is undeniably um, threats of genocide I just can't. It's incomprehensible. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I think yes, that the the way that the 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 ripples of this, the reverberations globally, in a, a social and and political respect, I think I like I've seen a lot of stories of the impact that this is happening on social groups and people who have, for example, like leftists who support Palestinian liberation mm. um, and are condemning you know, the actions of the Israeli state and having conflict with Jewish friends and mm. uh, because of this and, like, yep, that actually tearing friendships apart. I've heard kind of multiple accounts of that and I find mm. that, you know, that's deeply sad as well. Yeah, it is deeply sad. And recognising that, I think recognising the pain and fear and the uncertainty that is ripping through both of those communities Mm. can be done in a way that isn't both sides in, you know, this conflict. Mm. We don't think yeah. you can be very clear to stand with Palestinian people who are an occupied people. The state yes. of Israel is maintaining this illegal occupation. They've been found by multiple human rights organisations to be operating system of apartheid. Um, mm. You know, the false equivalence the, between these two yeah. bodies or the representation is at an internal religious conflict and why can't these guys mm. sort it out? Like you can reject all that while still acknowledging the fact that obviously Jewish people are in fear of anti-Semitic violence and the yeah. attacks by Hamas on October 7th were, were horrific and you can understand why that would reverberate so much mm. through through the Jewish diaspora across the um, country, uh, across the world rather, and and also, I mean, has moved some uh, Jewish people across the world to to take action and stand in solidarity and call on the Israeli government to call off their system of apoc- yeah. you know, occupation and apartheid as well. Yeah, yeah. The justification of what Israel is doing right now, uh, of course, all comes down to Israel having an absolute right to defend itself. And we're also told Israel doesn't target civilians and everything that they're doing is in accordance with international law. It is, of course, a retaliation to Hamas's attack in southern Israel on October the 7th, in which Hamas militants slaughtered almost 1,400 Israelis, including children, took almost 200 hostages. That includes many Israelis, but also some foreign nationals. They're still being held by Hamas at the moment. Mm. Again, that attack was a war crime under international law. It can be condemned, but no, one war crime does not, cannot justify another war crime, let alone multiple war crimes, which the Israeli state is now committing. And no one has a right to commit war crimes or breach international law. If we if we believe, it, maybe these are like foolish, naive, liberal notions, but like if we're seriously talking about, if you make any noise about abiding by international law, no matter what Hamas did on October the 7th, does not justify what Israel is doing. The only way you could mm. justify it is by claiming that Israel's absolute right to self-defence allows them to do whatever the fuck they want. And yeah. that does seem to be the position of America and Israel's other allies. Yeah, and there's always this is the, you know, I think we see cons- constantly and like particularly from the Israeli state uh, in the way that they have occupied Palestine, it's it's the cognitive dissonance. Like it, it'll be, we have a right to do whatever we want, 
also we would never you, yes. we would never target civilians but if and when we do target civilians which we don't uh yeah. that's allowed because we're defending <laughs> ourselves and it's like okay well which is it yes but i think as well i mean it's worth noting just just briefly i i thought someone raised an, an interesting point with me recently that it's like yeah there's a I guess we need to be wary of the over-reliance on we need to comply with international law mm. when international law has, you know, has failed the like ha has failed Palestine so profoundly. Yeah. And, you know, consistently sided with and legitimized, yeah, this apartheid state yeah. that that Israel is is running and uh yeah, and the oppression of the, the Palestinian people. It's like international law is not infallible um but it's it's true that they're breaking it all the same <laughs> mm. this term israel's 9 11 has been doing the rounds too as well i think uh, president biden was like oh actually in proportion to the population of israel it's 15 9 11s right um now what about palestine what about Palestine, of course? I mean, yeah, you could use that phrase on a regular basis for almost yeah. every statement being released by Western authority figures. But, and I'm certainly not the first person to know this, it's so ironic, right? Like, surely now we recognise that the response to 9-11 was horrific, mm -hmm. was an absolute travesty, didn't make anybody safer, didn't deliver justice and resulted in the West committing a whole bunch of war crimes, creating more yeah. terrorists. Does Biden? <laughs> like it, yeah, apparently not. I don't know. I guess he's made some noises in that direction, American but obviously. Democrats, I don't even know these days. No. And also, you know, of course, exactly the same thing when anyone tried to put the 9 11 attacks into any kind of context while still mm -hmm. absolutely condemning the slaughter of those 3,000 innocent people mm. as unacceptable and bad and terrible. But to, if anyone would draw any kind of conclusion about American interventionism, in the Middle East playing a role or indeed America directly funding the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, literally giving money and arms to to Osama bin Laden himself, as if this, you know, this all that history and context can be completely ignored and everything you need to know happened on September 11th, 2001, and we will, we will react accordingly with devastating consequences. Like it's ironic that the people who are trying to drum up sympathy and support for Israel are describing this as Israel's 9-11 as if, you know, therefore their response to it is entirely justified, whereas the history, the lessons from that history are completely the opposite. Yeah. Uh, we've seen Israeli citizens, including families of those murdered, families of hostages and people who managed to escape Hamas's attacks, desperately calling on Israel to not use their mm -hmm. suffering to unleash more death and suffering. So once again, you know, solidarity with um, members of the Jewish community who you know, recognise that their persecution as a people and these specific attacks do not justify what is happening to, get to Gaza right now and are willing yeah. to say so, um, despite the kind of throw, um, um, blowback they might receive from their from fellow people in the mm. Jewish community and more broadly. Mm -hmm. I think that's important and admirable and good. Mm. I'd be interested in your thoughts about, like, the kind of words that we can and can't use, the slipperiness of mm -hmm. terms like war in this context and terrorists, Okay. Because it, it, it seems to me like the, the war is changing every day. It's a war on Hamas. It's a war on Gaza. Is it a war on Palestine? Is it a war on terror, which once again proved to be an absolute disaster yeah. in the early 21st century? And the, the, the slipperiness, and this has been true, I think, throughout the, Israel, the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict, of course, anything that any Palestinian militant does is terrorism because they aren't mm -hmm. recognised as a state and so yeah. they cannot have a military and so... Any mm. violence that they do whatsoever is terrorism, and that's in this whole separate category to, you know, when nation states yeah. commit violence and war, right? Yes, yeah, like that's. It, it's so ironic that there are these strict kind of boundaries around what you're allowed to discuss and what you're not when it comes to the occupation and you know and the the war on Gaza and, and Palestine. And like like you were just talking about, you you know you can't place things in context. And there's even there's particular phrases and words that that we're not allowed to use. And that I think like have we seen that so much this week, particularly just even in the Australian political context, mm. and the way that that manifests in things like that fucking you know we get tweets from uh, Penny Wong where it's like the word Palestine is not 
mentioned, you know, Palestinian people isn't mentioned, Israel isn't mentioned, you know, war crimes, bombing, airstrike, nothing isn't mentioned. She's trying to, she's talking about, you know, this, the the bombing at, at a hospital in Gaza and and it's like, who, what are we talking about? Because mm. they, you can't provide any context. And then the other thing that I actually thought, yes, yeah, so there's this article that was published after Max Chandler Mather's speech in Parliament um, about Palestine, and maybe we'll get to this on the motion, the amendment that the Greens moved to the mm-hmm. government's proposed motion, um, which would have also condemned the Israeli state's actions uh, in this war. And I think this is in the Australian, if not the Korea, it's a News Corp article anyway by, by Matthew Killer and uh, about green speech sparks outrage. And <laughs> I'll read you a little bit um, because Please it's do. focusing. I love, I love hearing Murdoch Media takes on well, it's a just green's the, position on Israel and Palestine. Yeah, I find the focus on rhetoric fascinating here. So Greens MP Max Chandler Mather accused Israel of, quote, mass war crimes and said it needed to be stopped from committing, quote, full-blown genocide against Palestine in an inflammatory speech just days after the ASIO boss urged people to tone down the rhetoric on the conflict. He has been accused of, quote, disgraceful commentary and trying to instigate outrage by invoking Israel and genocide together. But the Griffith MP said he would not apologise for, quote, calling for peace and a ceasefire and an end to this massacre. He goes on, ASIO Chief Mike Burgess last week warned of a, quote, direct correlation between language that inflames tension and an increase in people who think violence is the answer. Mr. Chandler Mather used inflammatory language in an adjournment speech, calling for an end to, quote, Israeli occupation of Palestine. The, the placement of the quotes is just really fascinating. But I'm like, Dude, okay, some people hang on. Put, put fucking quote marks around Palestine. Around Palestine. Like. People will say there is yeah, no I such mean, thing as Palestinians. Hell. And but the the ASIO chief's thing where I'm like, okay, so hang on, he's saying there's a there's a link between language that inflames tension and people who think violence is the answer. And it's like, what do you mean language that inflames tension? How do you like by virtue of that description, it inflames tension? So what are you actually saying? How do you then define inflammatory language without a totally tautological definition that's like, oh, what's inflammatory language? Language that inflames tension. Okay, so (laughs) what does that mean? And yet how far does that spread? Because it seems like it only spreads to the extent like it it basically is defined by by what the Israeli state and the Israeli military are willing for you to use. And you can't use the word Palestine. You can't say invasion. You can't say occupation. You can't say Israel. You can't say genocide. Mm. And like, I I guess, you know, I can understand. So a, a lot of the outrage that, um, that was sparked by Max's speech, or at least when he was delivering it in the chamber, is the new member for Bowman, Henry Pike, was interjecting when he used the word genocide. And his yeah. argument that was that to invoke genocide and Israel in the same sentence in the context of the Holocaust is deeply offensive to Jewish people. And first of all, I mean, the conflation of the state of Israel with Jewish people obviously is problematic in itself. Yeah. Um, but it's it's also like yes like I can understand that that would be offensive but but or not even necessarily that it can be offensive but it, that it can be triggering for Jewish people who have been you know who have grown up with this kind of collective and generational memory of a horrific genocide um, and you know a, a centuries long oppression of your people um, but I just yes like do we then just decide that we're not allowed to literally use this word? genocide when it is being inflicted or, Mm. you know, encouraged to be inflicted upon another people. We're just not allowed to say that. Now, what they mean is don't say the truth. That's what they mean. Don't stop bringing up the truth because that's not helpful, right? Again, a clip of Owen Jones on the UK, in the the UK on... um, on a, on a panel appearance and this guy next to him says, like, I just don't think you're helping. And all Owen Jones did is laid out facts about what is happening to Palestine, right? Helping who? Helping what? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> you, you, you're providing inconvenient truths which, you know, complicate my position and make me question right. my unwavering support for Israel and that is unacceptable. And I'm sorry, like like there are literally genocide experts going on. There was an interview with one on Democracy Now. This mm-hmm. guy's whole thing, I believe he's Jewish himself, his whole thing is understanding 
genocide in historical and political context. And he's saying this is textbook genocide. The language being used by Israeli uh, ministers and the actions of the Israeli military uh, and they're, they're very stated, like, open intentions to, to ethnically cleanse, to wipe out Hamas at whatever cost will result in something amounting to an attempted genocide on Palestinian peoples in Gaza. Um, yeah. So it's, it's inflammatory language. Well, <laughs> the inflammatory actions are being committed by the State of Israel right now. And describing mm. that, calling that for their, what that is, is important, particularly in a media and political environment in which, yeah, there's just widespread censorship. I mean, again, in the UK, there's talk about like literally banning the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, mm. like that becoming an illegal thing to say <laughs> and, you know, basically saying shut down any protests, arrest anybody who yeah. is publicly illustrating uh, or, or, or showing solidarity to, to Palestinian people. Well, yeah, and exactly, and I can only, I mean, I think it is, it's disgusting, frankly, this, uh, and insidious, um, this intent to, like, this this focus on rhetoric over reality. Because, yes, the discussion becomes totally about how inflammatory, you know, a Greens person's speech or motion in Parliament was because of the words that they used and not how inflammatory and fucked up the reality of children dying, of a hospital being bombed, of people being hemmed in without access to, you know, food and water, of people being stripped of their lands and their sovereignty for, you know, for decades, how abhorrent that is. And so, yeah, that's exactly it, is that they they want to make the, the debate and the issue at the front of everyone's minds about how we frame this in the correct way rather than should we maybe try to stop people from fucking dying and from Israel uh, completely raising an entire city to the ground and, and killing, you know, thousands if not millions of people? Uh, because, yeah, we, we can't do that if we're just caught up in, but we can't call it that. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm conscious of time. We could probably talk about this for, for six hours. Um, I mean, obviously, and you referenced it a few times here, the major story, well, not the major story, one of the major Flashpoints of this conflict this week was a blast at the Al Ali Al Arabi Hospital. Mm. I, I guess I, I think we may just move on. It, it, only that, only in that at the time of recording, we just simply don't know what happened in, yeah. in that particular case. There is competing narratives. Of course, Israel says that the result of that um, that blast at the hospital, which has killed hundreds of people, we know at least the death mm. toll is also still debated, but at least hundreds of people. Uh, Israel says it was a misfired uh, rocket from Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They deny mm. that, and Hamas is saying it was an Israeli airstrike. Mm. We we just simply don't know. There have been competing narratives. There have been lots of changed stories, particularly from the IDF. I will I will say. Mm. I think the important thing to underline there, of course, is the idea that it cannot be Israel because Israel does not target hospitals. Is bullshit. Israel oh, yep. has targeted hospitals. Yeah. Um, this particular hospital got multiple calls from the IDF telling them to evacuate in the days mm. leading up to the attack, which seems relevant. And Israel is lying all over the place. We've got human rights organisations pointing to the use of white phosphorus in Gaza. Again, a war crime. Israel d- denies that. And then yeah. you can just look through the history, just re- incident after incident yeah. of Israel immediately in response to some kind of tragedy or attack saying, absolutely not us. An investigation reels later revealing that to not be the case, and is all going now. Nah, well, what are you going to do? We got to yeah. we got to defend. defend Which, in the past, by the way, politicians like our very own Prime Minister Anthony Albanese would have condemned. So um, let's let's come on to the domestic front. On Monday, Parliament returned. They passed a motion expressing its support for the State of Israel in this time, condemning the Hamas attacks, and expressing, um, at least according to the motion of the Parliament, Australia's unwavering support for Israel. Albanese proclaimed the parliament stands with Israel and recognises its inherent right to defend itself. I want to repeat the message I've given to all Jewish Australians since the outset. You are not alone. Your fellow Australians stand with you. And once again, what you said before, Emerald, conflating the positions Mm. and the welfare of Jewish people with the state of Israel is doing the thing that people who accuse the left of being anti-Semites say that you can't mm-hmm. do, right? Yeah. So, of course, you cannot assume that all Jewish people you know, support or have anything to do with the state of Israel. That is anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. That is a trope. You cannot do the reverse and say that the only way to support the Jewish community, you know, in Australia or indeed across the world, is to unquestionably and unwaveringly stand with the state of Israel. That's, that mm-hmm. is an anti-Semitic thing and it's bad. Yes. 
So Labour hasn't been great on this, of course, but uh, Dutton and the coalition have gone absolutely fucking mental, just completely rejecting any idea of a ceasefire or showing any kind of restraint. The coalition yeah. proudly supports Israel proudly supports Israel's right to do what is necessary and needed in the circumstances with every asset available to safeguard its sovereignty, to bolster its borders, to protect its people and to thwart threats it now faces. Jesus fucking Christ. Carte blanche. Fucking go for it. What an what yeah. an absolute fucking psychopath. Yeah. You talk about inflammatory rhetoric? How about that? Mm. Yeah. Thankfully, there is a party that is not insane with bloodlust <laughs> and is prepared to stand up for Palestinian rights. Now, I say that with a disclaimer of we're talking about parliamentary motions here, but I would actually argue, you know, I don't think here at Serious Danger we're that invested in the <laughs> the proposing of parliamentary motions, generally speaking. <laughs> we, we think they're probably, dare I say, it, a level of virtue signalling. Yeah. But I actually think at a time like this mm. they might actually mean something and I'm so fucking grateful yeah. that... Greens MPs had the backbone to stand mm. up there. The only federal party at a level, I'd, I'd shout out to Victorian Socialists, lots of other left-wing parties I'm sure across the country who we might not be familiar with who are standing in solidarity with Palestine, but in terms of a federal platform, the Greens, the only party prepared to actually take a stand on this and and try and correct yeah. the record yeah. and give a full context to this discussion. Yeah, one of those moments that makes you a little bit, you know, proud and grateful to have our MPs in there. Yeah. So we tried to get a motion through the Senate earlier in the week. The Green Senator Larissa Waters asked Penny Wong uh, whether she'd call on Israel to stop its imminent ground invasion of Gaza and whether the Australian government supported the blockade of Gaza. Wong did not directly mm. answer the question but called for the protection of human life and restraint. Okay. Um, the Greens Who, later tried to secure this. Yeah. I, I, again, humans. it's like they'll say, you know, it's, it's like Palestinian lives matter in theory but not. Mm. Not in practice, like not when it's the Israeli state killing them. <laughs> yes. There has to be this other step, right? You call for everything to, to abide by international law. We have mm. unwavering, un, you know, just undeniable evidence that Israel is not doing that. Mm. And then the, there has to be another step, right? Not, you can't just yeah. be like, well, call for international no law. That hasn't happened with our allies. And we have a different mm. relationship to Israel, obviously, than we do to the Palestinian people. Mm. We have some level of influence. Certainly the US has a whole fuckload of, of influence and gives them shitloads of money yeah. and stands with them in democratic support. So you could actually do something. You could actually make a difference. And if you don't do that next step, your earlier call for international law is bullshit and meaningless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Marine Fruki is out there calling this weasel words, you know, solidarity to Marine and thank you for being there and saying what you say. Mm -hmm. And then in the House, and this is just so, <laughs> it's so insane to me, this the most the most reasonable and mild of amendments was tried to put yeah. to this motion as the parliament tried to condemn Hamas and stand in solidarity with Israel. Uh, Greens leader Adam Bant pushed to replace support for Israel's right to defend itself in Albanese's motion with the condemnation of the bombing of Palestinian civilians and a warning against the imminent invasion of the Gaza Strip. In an amendment that was also backed by Teal Independents, Dr. Sophie Scamps, Kylia Tink, Kylia Kylie Tink, Kylie Tink, sorry, Kylie, and yeah. Andrew Wilkie. Now, the amendment the Greens were going for was to condemn the war crimes perpetrated by the State of Israel, including the bombing of Palestinian civilians, and said that for there to be peace, there must be an end to the State of Israel's illegal occupation of the Palestinian territories. Crazy stuff, Emerald. Truly, only the also, ravings of like, a madman. How could the Greens, like, sorry, but yeah, could the Greens seriously support a motion that gives the Israeli state carte blanche, like, right to defend themselves i mean it it is the fourth pillar like we are a very explicitly anti-war party yes. like what do you fucking expect you guys really surprised like i yeah Ben told the parliament the greens joined everyone in this parliament in mourning the 1300 israelis who have lost their lives he wanted to highlight mm -hmm. there are also between 2300 and 2600 palestinians this is back mm -hmm. on monday by the way heaps more since then who yeah. have lost their lives many of whom are children and we mourn them as well Seems oh, how dare fucking he? reasonable to me. How yeah. dare he? <laughs> this is now moving beyond self-defence into an invasion. Absolutely correct. And it is up to Australia as a peace-loving country to, jo to join the push. <laughs> Astri I mean, okay, uh, sure. Astri yeah, that's, that's what we right. want to pre present ourselves as. Yes, sure. sure. Okay, the, yeah. the elements of Australia. Aspirationally <laughs> speaking. <laughs> The Greens voted against the looming invasion of Gaza, but the rest of Parliament voted to back it, he later said. A humanitarian disaster in Gaza can turn into a humanitarian catastrophe if the invasion proceeds. Absolutely correct once again. Mm -hmm. 
Now, those independents, those teals who fell into lo- who, who supported the amendment, uh, including Andrew Wilkie, eventually um, voted for the motion, even though that amendment was defeated mm-hmm. and the Greens stayed true. And you might have seen a photo of our four lower house Greens yeah. MPs not because- voting to support this motion because this motion unequivocally endorsed the State of Israel's right to defend itself, did not condemn them for the war crimes that are being perpetuated and, you know, showed no solidarity for the oppressed people, the Palestinian people who are having the absolute shit bombed out of them at the moment by this very state that we're talking mm-hmm. about. And yet the media story is look at this picture of the Greens refusing to condemn Hamas uh, and, you know, stand in solidarity with Israeli people who have um, lost their lives. Like that's the way that the fucking media twists this. It's just fucking insane. Yeah, how about look at all these people on the other side who are voting, mm. who, who refuse to condemn Palis- the war crimes being waged against the Palestinian people. <laughs> like because there was an amendment to do that. You could, yeah. you could do both, right? Yeah. You could, you could they do had both. an opportunity to do both actually and they'll they say an that they condemn they the loss of down. lives on both sides and yet they literally voted against it. So, mm. And you could maybe you could maybe say, well, okay, maybe the Greens should have supported that well, no, actually, the Greens shouldn't have supported that that motion, no. as such as it was as it was worded. But if there was another motion that was going to be placed, that was going to be then passed by the Parliament to say something about Palestinian rights and solidarity, but of course that's never going to happen. This was it. This no. was the Australian Parliament statement on this current conflict and situation. And if you're going to do that statement without condemning these war crimes, and if you're going to do it, the only way you can do it apparently is by um, endorsing the, the State of Israel's right to do anything the fuck it wants in the context of the current war crimes that are going on, then of course yeah. the only moral position is to is to object to that and vote against it. Yeah. Them. If defending themselves means what they have been doing, which is killing thousands of innocent civilians, yeah. you just voted to support that. Yep. <laughs> yes. And you can't say you weren't warned. They said they said that's exactly what they were going to fucking do. Yeah, yeah. Oh that's the thing. Yeah, that's right. They well they warn civilians first before they bomb them and that makes them so much better than other militaries. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Hey, I'm going to shoot you now. Like, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. Escape through this, um, the, the rougher crossing down the down the south. It's, oh, we've bombed yeah, you, like as, you fucking... tra- as you try to leave that crossing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Nathan For You episode where it's like, yeah, yeah, you can get this discount. You just have to get past the crocodile. And like, you're welcome. Why didn't you? Why didn't you leave? Uh, the reaction, of course, to this has been insane. The Executive Council of Australian Jury co-CEO Alex Rivkin accused the Greens of being the party of hypocrisy and dishonour. Okay. New podcast title, question mark. <laughs> he also described the Greens as so hardwired in their loathing of Israel and distrust of the Australian Jewish community that they could not even extend symbolic solidarity with our community. That's wrong. I don't wrong. Know. We've They've done, done that time many that. times, like Incorrect. issued many statements extending solidarity with the Jewish community, but go off. Yes. And, what, and the Jewish community... Like Jewish voices for peace, the Jewish voices, mm-hmm. the, the if not now forces that are like literally barricading the yep. White House right now, calling to an end to the occupation of apartheid. Uh, not that mm-hmm. they're not the real Jewish community. No, no, just no the ones fake, that fake are Jews. Unquestionably right. Zionist, no matter what. That, that's the actual yeah. real Jewish community. That's the only one you should listen yeah, to. Yeah, okay, right. Defence Minister Richard Miles labeled the Greens' action despicable, saying they really couldn't miss this moment more. Go fuck yourself, mate. Despite the stunt, the original motion passed by an overwhelming 134 votes to four. The Greens amendment was eventually voted down 107 to 7. I was amazed. Like just nowhere in the Australian media does this position get any kind of credit or is taken seriously or investigated or given credit for, for what it really was. On the Party Room podcast, which is released by the ABC with Frank Kelly and Patricia Garvelis, Frank Kelly uh, described the Greens amendment as an antagonistic move. And the 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 Calling discussion between peace. all these journalists okay. was, oh, they're just doing this for politics, and, and and like, no, maybe they actually fucking believe something. If this motion is actually going to be something, if it means mm. something and represents the position of the Australian Parliament, the Australian people, you should have nothing but respect for a group of politicians that, in the face of all this hatred and blowback, mm. are willing to actually take a stand and stand up for what's right um, in, yeah. in this motion. Yeah. Yeah. Zoe fucking Daniel, teal hero, the progressive um, oh, you know, the hero teals. that we all love, a f- former foreign correspondent for the ABC, former critic of the State of Israel before she ran for politics, which she completely backtracked huh. during the uh, 2022 election through Palestinians under the bus, 
I disagree emphatically with those who supported the amendment. Among other things, the effect of the amendment would have been to remove support for Israel's right to self-defense. Again, this right, which apparently oh, just remo- means they can okay. do whatever they want. Sure. As I said in the chamber yesterday, Israel has a right to self-defense in line with the rules of war, which would include protection of civilians in Gaza, reiterating what I've said publicly, mm. repeatedly, emphatically. So, so as long as they do it in line with international war, it's fine. They're not doing it in right. line with international so war. So what well, the Greens right amendment was itself. about, which was yeah. including protection of civilians in Gaza. Right. Literally exactly what the amendment was. So why didn't you support that? And I guess I would like to extend credit and solidarity to members within the Labor Party who are breaking ranks, um, especially first term WA Senator Fatima Payman, an Afghan-born Muslim, gave a speech in Parliament um, condemning Israel's actions at the moment. The price tag of Israel's right to defend itself cannot be the destruction of Palestine. Israel's right to defend its civilians cannot equate to the annihilation of Palestinian civilians. Pretty brave of her to do that. Yeah. Struggle of her to stand up. I mean, again, thanks to Labor's voting rules, she couldn't vote against any Labor motion or whatever, so she had to fall into line there. And Ali and Ed Husick have also spoken out. And, you know, solidarity to them, but Jesus Christ, it's pretty fucked up that Labor just leaves it to their Muslim MPs yeah. to take a stand on this. And By to, to make the very no mild solidarity. points that yeah. Palestinians are human beings. Mm, yeah. What a fucking party, honestly. And looking at the situation and coming to the inevitable conclusion that according to Israel and according to its Western allies, Palestinian lives are worth less than Israeli lives. Like we're just, Mm -hmm. that's just, you cannot come to any other conclusion looking at the events of this week and what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Final point, which I just thought was very revealing. Philip Deladakis is a former Labor MP in Victoria tweeted this this idea, this photo of the Greens um, opposing oh, yeah. the motion and wrote this. It actually gets worse. Adam Ban attempted to move an amendment that would effectively call Israel out for war crimes. You can't make this stuff up. The Greens are not fit for office. Now, he clearly is writing that to be like, and of course Israel isn't doing war crimes, but the way he's phrased it is the problem is calling Israel out yeah. for the war crimes that they're definitely doing. It, it seems like a fake tweet. Hey, like it seems like <laughs> a joke almost. Like, can you believe the Greens wanted to call out war crimes? You can't make this stuff up. What That's what's losing. crazy to you. Okay. Really says a lot. We'll have some more suggestions in the call to action. For now, though, I just want to say uh, standwithpalestine.au is a fantastic resource. This is our, our friend Fahad Ali, who's an amazing Palestinian activist, has sort of collated um, actions, places to volunteer, ways to write your MP on this particular front. Stand with Palestine.au. I definitely recommend checking that out. And we work absolutely every single day to earn the trust and the privilege of representing our communities because that's what grassroots community building and change looks like. It looks like all of you. For the community that was built, for the campaign that was run, because campaigns are a manifestation of hope. They are a movement to achieve all of the things that all of us so deeply and profoundly believe in. And they don't end here. Because all of us know that so many of our communities have been struggling under this trickle-down economics thing that so many of those other political parties take for granted. Under an economic system that exploits both people and the planet. But all of us here in this room know that that stuff, that ain't inevitable. Bit of a refresher for some hope. To finish off the episode, we have a guest from across the ditch. Chloe Swarbrick is the New Zealand Greens MP for Auckland Central. She was first elected in 2017 as the youngest MP in Aotearoa at 23 years old, and she just won re-election and got a whole bunch of new friends in Parliament. Is that right? You were the youngest in New Zealand? I was, yeah, the youngest in like 43 years or something. Um, yeah, okay. I never sought to define myself by my age, but everybody else did. <laughs> Everyone else did. Yeah, that's right. So we, we've done it too now. But the, the reason we've got you on the show is she's just won re-election and got a bunch of new Greens friends in Parliament. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing the show, Chloe. Um, we know you've probably got a little bit on. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a few things on. We're in, um, I'm in Porniki, Wellington at the moment, uh, our capital, which is where our parliament is based, uh, a long way from home. Um, 
But yeah, we've just been having a week of meetings and induction for our amazing new MPs. We've gone from a caucus of nine in the last term to now 14, possibly 15. And we've uh, done the first time that we've ever uh, won an electorate two times in a row. Uh, and we've gone from one electorate to three electorates or three Huge. seats that specifically represent a geography. So yeah, it's historic for us on a number of fronts, not the least that we also have simultaneously defied history by continuing to grow our party vote despite uh, also having that relationship with government usually mm. for the smaller parties and a governing relationship in the context of Aotearoa and New Zealand's political history uh, they disappear so yes, <laughs> we to retain point. our own identity yeah. uh, and continue campaigning uh, and I think also take a proposition to the people of this country that uh, we actually can do the necessarily radical change to ensure that we have an economy that serves both people and the planet as opposed to the other way around yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so sorry, I, just the election was on Saturday and you're already straight into fucking inducting these new MPs like right off the bat. You guys don't get a few days to celebrate or anything or what's going oh, on? Oh, no. It's, I mean, it's pretty full <laughs> noise from the get, to be honest. Um, I mean, we're still waiting for special votes to come through, which are two weeks after the uh, final vote count. What's interesting about our special votes this time around is that there's around half a million and that represents 20% of the total vote count. So typically off the back of special votes, which are people who have cast their votes in electorates that aren't theirs or folks who are on the unlisted role for security reasons or whatever else mm -hmm. or people overseas, they do tend to err to the left. What, mm. however, is different and interesting about this election is that uh, the parties that are of the more left than the ostensible mm -hmm. centre left of the Labour Party uh, have picked up a lot of support. So that's mm -hmm. us from the Greens and also Te Pāti Māori uh, has picked up, gone from yeah. two MPs to four. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. And so I guess just to, and, and maybe you can correct us if we've got this wrong, but for people who may not be super familiar with Aotearoa's uh, voting system, it's you've got mixed member proportionals. So yep. unlike in Australia where we've got two houses, in the lower house, you know, one MP is is voted in per electorate on a preferential voting basis. And then we have the Senate, the upper house, where we have quotas and we have party lists there. You've kind of got, you've got both of those squished into one house effectively. Yeah. Um, and you don't have preferential voting. Is that right? You don't do preferences. It's just first past the post. Yeah, so we have a unicameral system and we're one of only three jurisdictions in the world that I know of off the top of my head that don't have a Supreme Codified Constitution. So we operate under mm -hmm. something called parliamentary supremacy or parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, we do have a local government system, but that's a creature of statute. So we don't need to get into that for now. But yeah, basically we just <laughs> have one house of parliament. We don't have an upper and a lower. Uh, and we have typically around 120 members of parliament. Uh, we will have an overhang in this parliament because of a... Uh, arcane rule yeah. that was only discovered off the back of a pretty unfortunate death of a candidate in Port Waikato, which means that yeah. we're going to have 121 seats in this parliament. Uh, and basically, when you go into the voting booth as uh, somebody who is eligible to vote, you have two votes. You have your party vote and you have who you want to represent you within the electorate. So of those 120 seats, uh, approximately 70 of them are for uh, electorate MPs and 50 of them are list-based. So the kind of easiest and most simple way to think about it is that the proportion of those party votes determines how many of those seats each party gets. So uh, we as the Greens got 10.7% on uh, election night, which entitles us to 14 seats, mm -hmm. but three of those are electorate seats. So that means it knocks the people who are potentially further down the list out, or mm -hmm. in the case of Tamitha Paul, who wasn't on the list, but won Wellington Central, it means that she comes in and number 14 on our list is now bumped out. Yeah, so okay. we are hoping that we still get right. uh, a slight bump in our uh, proportionality come those special votes being counted, which means that we will have 15, but 14 of those technically, or 11 of those technically from the list. So yeah, yeah so okay, confusing right. in that respect. And but so, that's well, yeah, how but it's almost like it represents the will of the people. You know, like, like if the Greens get 10% <laughs> well, of the national vote, then maybe they should get something close to 10% mm, of the seats in the federal parliament there for reflecting what people actually voted for. I mean, well, it's a, it's a wacky system. Well, this is why there was a really strong uh, campaign, we'll you know, 25 years ago um, yeah. on precisely mm -hmm. this. Um, it was actually some of the forebears of the Green Party who were really heavily involved um, in that campaign for mixed member proportional moving from first past the post. So yeah, we're really stoked to be operating in this system, but I think we're also seeing maturing of the Green Party because uh, before I won Auckland Central in 2020, uh, we had not won an electorate since Jeanette Fitzsimons won uh, in the first ever MMP election. So, right, when, uh, and when that, was that? 
Uh, that would have been in the nineties, in the late nineties, yeah, right. early two okay, thousands. Yeah. So yeah, it's been it's been a long time, and I think that now having won three electorates, we've also demonstrated the really important power of localism and mm-hmm. kind of positive feedback loops in terms of grassroots community movement and achieving those outcomes in a legislative environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of what we've seen in Australia as well. We have found in you know for a long time we'd pick up Senate seats. We were able to win Senate seats, but found it really hard to get lower house seats. We had one until the most recent election. You probably know we picked up an extra three, and I think a lot of that was because we really focused on that kind of local representation, that grassroots connection with the community. Um, yeah. And I guess yeah, it works. <laughs> you know, we were able, and we want to want to keep doing that. So. I think it's the future of politics, to be honest yeah. with you. Like the one of the hot takes out of this election, which has been really fascinating for me to see from Parliament's press gallery, is uh, if you look at the makeup of electorates in Auckland. So Auckland, for context, is our largest city in this country. There's a ton of electorates there because electorates are typically kind of proportional on population size, which means some of them are huge geographically. Uh, mm. Whereas in Auckland, yeah. we've got a ton of them all kind of mushed in together. So I represent the centre of it, Auckland Central, which is not only our city centre, but also our Hauraki islands uh but basically uh the kind of generalized theory from the press gallery because so much of Auckland flipped uh blue to the national party but Mm -hmm. obviously we retained Auckland central uh and therefore retained it green uh is that there was some overhang from decisions that were made under the labor led government around COVID and lockdowns and everything else and I find that really fascinating as an Aucklander because the press gallery based in Wellington is once again projecting onto us the, the things uh-huh. that the kind of Aucklanders were apparently thinking. But my hot take from it, having spoken to and obviously campaigned really heavily uh, and being an Aucklander who was in the midst of those lockdowns is that, sure, there might be some kind of hangover from that. But generally my sense is that people felt as though decision making was far too centralized in Wellington so I think the really interesting thematic of localism continues to be a key point which for me is really related to the relationship that we need to have with local government to actually solve problems locally moving Mm -hmm. forward which obviously offers us a key kind of insight into what meaningful solutions look like uh, when we're talking about green infrastructure and climate change but also localized economies and otherwise. Yeah, I um I very much relate uh, as a Queenslander to having like media understandings of why your area voted the way it did just projected yeah. onto you and and a lot of the time it's yeah it's it's the idea that the electorate is more conservative than um than it actually is and we it have did. it with people saying that you know Queenslanders maybe didn't vote for our centrist left uh, Labor Party. And that was because of coal somehow or because they don't want to see climate change. When in reality, I think similarly, it's a sense that it was, you know, a really anti-political sentiment um, and the idea that they weren't being offered a genuine or an inspiring alternative. And so, you know, we want to kind of get into exactly what, like why you think that the Greens vote has grown in, in Aotearoa in this election, what you were putting to the people that maybe resonated with them. So I think what was really interesting, obviously all politics becomes super reductive when you get into the sphere of slogans, right? But I think mm-hmm. there was a pretty interesting insight that we can extrapolate from in the slogans that every political party put forward. So you had uh, the Labour Party uh, saying, and it's for you. And my kind of general proposition was, who is you? Because they had previously <laughs> yes. commissioned at the start of this year our research, which showed that we had one of the most unfair tax systems in the entire world, which sees 311 families holding more wealth combined than the bottom two and a half million New Zealanders, which is a consequence of a tax system that sees those wealthiest people in this country pay effectively half the tax rate of the average New Zealander, <laughs> and then deciding to do nothing about it, despite commissioning that research, right? So like off the bat at the start of this year, we knew that the economy and the tax system was fundamentally and structurally and and therefore intentionally or by neglect unfair, but we still had a political party that was in charge of it with an overwhelming majority saying that they were in it for you. (laughs) Then we had from the (laughs) National Party uh, the slogan, uh, get New Zealand back on track or whatever, and there was like a bit of irony in this because uh, they also wanted to- Make New Zealand great again, basically. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the sentiment. Um, But the funny thing about using the terminology of track was that they also wanted to kill the light rail projects, which- uh, right. You know, we wanted to get, you know, in terms of decongesting, particularly our largest cities. So, you know, classic, same old um, kind of milk toast center right uh, kind of cost of living um, economy framing. And then for the Greens, you know, uh, being as earnest as we are when we're banning about different slogan ideas around our caucus, we ended up coming up with 
as uh, you know profoundly as we possibly can. The time is now, which is like all of the stuff that we've been saying forever, particularly in our larger cities and also in our regions that have been devastated by um, climate change, like induced and charged weather events over the past few years. That the climate stuff that we've been saying and also the economy stuff that we've been saying, all of that is now coming to the fore and we have to act. Uh, so the kind of proposition that we took to the electorate is the same kind of stuff that I joined the Green Movement for, which is really solid foundational values of you know care for people on the planet, but implemented through uh, independently costed evidence-based policy. So we had seven um, top-line key policy priorities, and all of them were really, really intentional about kind of targeting specific areas that we knew that we could actually make serious um, kind of gains as a country in terms of transforming the economy, but also ensuring that housing was treated not as a commodity, but as the human right that we apparently recognize it as based on our you know, UN things that we've signed up to. Uh, and yeah, that was the basic kind of proposition that we took out to people. And what was really interesting about this election compared to the last one, particularly on that tax point that I raised before, is that we campaigned in 2020 on a wealth tax at a point in time that uh, it wasn't as well known just how unfair our tax system mm -hmm. was. And we you know, spent that whole campaign kind of socializing it. We knew that it was popular uh, and we ended up obviously growing our vote off the back of it. But we didn't get to the point that we did this time around where there was such overwhelming demand because the like Labour Party had commissioned government research and advice which had told them the same damn thing. So we yeah. were starting as well with, I think, a slightly more inherent understanding from the New Zealand public that our economy is fundamentally unfair and it's set up that way. So, yeah, I think there was perhaps a kind of greater public awareness and sympathy to the proposition that we would be bringing forward to. Yeah. And then you also have to contextualize that with, as I was alluding to, particularly in our largest city, while we had had, you know, in the West Coast and the East Coast, up in Northland and at the top of the South, really severe climate change charge weather events over the past few years. At the beginning of this year on Auckland Anniversary Weekend at the end of January, we had flooding uh, in our major city unlike we had ever seen before, followed up two weeks later by Cyclone Gabriel. And, you know, people died. It was the first time that we had seen the realities of climate change visited on our largest city in the country. So I do think that for some, there was definitely this kind of backstop of climate kind of induced anxiety too. Mm, so similar to us in 2022, where we'd come off the back of massive floods. Sorry, Tom. You're twins, Errol. You're the same as Chloe, okay? <laughs> yeah. Is that what you want to hear? Yeah. Yeah. I got to say, though, there was definitely um, <laughs> an element where the, particularly from the centre right and from the far right, uh, a real attempt to overshadow those climate concerns with um, the ostensible cost of living framing. Mm. And obviously we then had the uphill battle to kind of help reconceptualize and help people understand that they're the same damn thing. Yes, yeah. yes, because if your insurance premiums go up, if you yep. lose your home, if you have to replace everything that you own, you know, it, yeah, power is more expensive. Like it's it's every I, I you know I think climate change is a cost of living issue, oh, and yeah, trying if you were to separate talk them about like food production and yeah. stuff, right? Exactly. Like I mean, yeah, yeah, we had when we had the change of leadership when Jacinda Ardern also decided to sit down at the beginning of this year, and mm -hmm. Chris Hipkins came in as the prime minister. He decided to reframe and start attacking um, from that position of kind of you know, uh, compassionate conservative uh, and mm -hmm. going after the National Party who were hammering the Labour Party on cost of living stuff and said that this was a bread and butter government. And our point the whole time is like, you can't talk about being bread and butter if you're not protecting the climate necessary to grow wheat. Like you yeah. have to actually follow the logical <laughs> yes. steps of the policies that you're putting in place. Yeah, that's mm. so true. I did just really quickly while we're talking about the you know tax policy stuff. I think one of the first things that I saw when I became aware that there was an election going on across the ditch um, was something from the New Zealand Greens about actually income tax cuts and you know the fact that lower income earners would mm -hmm. pay X less tax. And I thought that was so interesting because I think that's an angle that we in Australia, you know, Australian Greens haven't really explored. We've gone hard on taxing the rich and increasingly yeah. so in the last few years, as I think we should, but haven't gone for that. Yeah, that flip side of it. And I was really curious to know how the response to that was and even, you know, what conversations were had leading up to that, because I don't know if it's something that's also new for you guys. It is definitely new for us uh, in the sense that 
much like you've kind of alluded to, the general narrative and framing of tax cuts is something that even I, as our revenue spokesperson, mm. am very wary of because it typically is used as the framing of the right. Yeah. But I think this is where we start to kind of dig into what it is that we're actually talking about when we're talking about the economy and what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about kind of progressive taxation. So this is the kind of research that I was alluding to before that came out of IRD, our inland revenue or tax department and uh, subsidiary papers from our treasury exposed that we had a deeply unfair tax system. And this research helped to feed into a report that Oxfam International did, which showcased that Aotearoa New Zealand has the 136th tax system in the entire world for addressing inequity because we are one of the only countries in the OECD that does not have a form of capital gains tax, inheritance tax, stamp duty, gift tax, uh, wealth tax, et cetera. So no tax that is set up to actually address those inequities and how different people may earn their income. Uh, And to that effect, I think that we kind of realized as we were working through all of this that it was also really important to acknowledge that our our sensibly progressive tax system as far as income goes uh, wasn't also reflecting a need to move with the times. So what we're saying is that we can do a form of tax switch as well as generate the necessary revenue to invest in our public services by instituting this wealth tax, which also allows us to alleviate pressure on lower income earners by pointing yeah. out that our tax system is de- deeply inequitable insofar as it overtaxes work and undertaxes, in fact, doesn't tax at all wealth and the kind of compounding accumulation of wealth. And that's how we end up with the disparities as you know, uh, outlaid uh, in minute detail from Thomas Piketty, the French economist. And, you know, mm. I could talk ad nauseum about this kind of well, stuff. Well, I'm like, yes, and it is quite, <laughs> I mean, without getting into the weeds of, of Marxist theory, like it's quite a socialist approach really to, yeah. to taxation to, you know, try and tax labour less and, and yep. wealth and capital more. But it also goes to the um, point which we really tried to continually point out, which is that the kinds of tax cuts that were being proposed from the right were trickle-down economics tax cuts, which Mm. saw people at the top end of town in terms of their incomes receive far, far more, whereas, you know, there was like a dollar or two that would actually be saved by the average income earner. So that was another really key point, is that not all tax cuts are the same and you are being sold ostensible tax cuts from the right, which are actually just mega tax cuts for the people at the top end of town and make next to no difference for you guys at the bottom while they also commit the expensive service cuts. Hmm. Hashtag not all tax cuts, yes. Yeah, <laughs> something like that, yeah. Like that. Well, we should um, maybe, I mean, those tax cuts are, are, could potentially happen if if the left uh, can't organise and, and stop it, this new government coming in and enacting their horrible agenda because that is what's mm. going to happen. And so, yeah, just laying out again, the National win, win 17 seats to come to victory of 50, Labor down between 28 and 31. I think it's still, I mean, right. those are still being counted, but it's something huge in the order. Drop which in is the a huge vote. landslide loss from Labor, something yeah. around there. Uh, Two questions on that. First of all, how did Labor <laughs> fuck it up so much? How do you go yeah. from Jacinda Ardern to this kind of result, do you think, in your analysis? And I know you've touched on some of that already, Chloe. And yeah. secondly, I mean, it's still shit news, right? Like this, these Tories are still going to come in and I guess what can we look forward to from our new conservative overlords in Aotearoa? <laughs> um, so I'll answer those in order. So uh, kind of the Jacinda effect and then um, conservative government. So I guess um, first things first, I obviously want to just acknowledge the fact that, you know, we tend to in politics when we're talking about individuals and the aura around individuals not be particularly astute at also talking about the systems and the structures that they and the cultural norms that they uphold and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to acknowledge first and foremost, like Jacinda Ardern was a phenomenal leader in many respects, but I do need to declare and make it very evident. Like there's a reason that I'm in the Green Party. Uh, You know, I am in the Greens because I have the courage of my convictions and I very strongly believe that we are now at a point where we necessarily are required to take very radical steps in terms of the way that we deal with our economy and the climate crises and otherwise. To that effect, I think that if you look at the 2017 to 2023 terms, and also they're quite different because we have three-year terms in this country. So 2017 to 2020, um, the arrangement was a three-party governing arrangement where you had the Labour Party and a party called New Zealand First, whose ghost has been revived Mm. and is now probably uh, potentially going to be part of another three-headed government, uh, and then us in a confidence and supply arrangement. So in 2017 to 2020, despite having fewer MPs than we did in the 2020 to 2023 term, 
uh, we had more influence because our eight votes were necessary to pass any piece of legislation that the government wanted to pass unless they worked with the National Party, which happened, yeah. for example, in the instance of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And trade. Right. Yeah. So we won't yeah. get into that, but that, that aside. So what we had with the Labour-led government in both of those terms was rhetoric of transformation which I think is what kind of echoed around the rest of the world, unfortunately met domestically with policies that largely just tinkered. So we were consistently told of, you know, alleviation in child poverty to a certain extent. But as James Shaw, our co-leader, so astutely points out, alleviation is not ending. <laughs> you know, no. you are still making a proactive decision and only reducing somewhat to leave some children in poverty. Yes, as though that's acceptable. And then we also saw incredible leadership in times of crises. So, for example, uh, with the Christchurch terrorist attack uh, and with COVID-19 and otherwise. So they were very, very good at communicating in those points of crisis, but not in the slow-moving crises of inequality yawning, of uh, the housing crisis, of uh, the climate crisis, you know. We as the Greens were consistently using every single lever that we had, but we were not able to get these wins across the line in the way that we needed to. And that was particularly profound in the 2020 to 2023 term where we still had those relationships with Labour. So we still had uh, ministers, albeit outside of cabinet in the form of our co-leaders with James primarily taking the climate portfolio and Marama taking the uh, portfolio to end family and sexual violence. They did a huge amount with it but we didn't have the treasury benches. So Labor had an mm. outright majority and we were in a cooperation agreement. So our votes right. were not necessary to pass legislation. And we mm. frequently actually would sometimes vote against the stuff that Labor was doing. Not because it didn't go far enough, because we're frequently working as constructively as we can. We're not going to you know, cut off our nose despite our face. But there were times when they were doing things which we were vehemently opposed to. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that that was the generalized context is that there was a huge amount of frustration from those on the left uh, or just everyday people that all of this transformation stuff hadn't happened. And I think that manifests in two potential kind of psyches or you know, multifaceted, but just to offer you a binary. One was that those of us who were you know, ready to organize and rally were doing that. And then others, because they felt like this rhetoric was meant with a reality that didn't match it felt like politics was Orwellian and completely disengaged from it. And we're mm -hmm. seeing that reflected in lower voting numbers. Yeah. So it's a really hard thing to be a, in that camp of organizing leftists when the majority of people have seen this rhetoric time and again not be met with that reality. You know, So we have to try and simultaneously inspire people to understand that the state can do those things and that we will deliver on those things mm -hmm. even if the last guys who promised you that stuff didn't deliver on it and that's again where i come Tough back to job. that point on localism <laughs> we have to show people localized proof of concept mm. yeah yeah and and so i guess yeah just briefly if, um, if you don't mind yeah what what can we expect from these this new national wonderful government that, that is oh, coming yeah, in because right. obviously we want to celebrate the good news story of the Greens growing their vote, the Labor's disappointment, that's not our, yeah. you know, that's not our circus, that's up to them, that's their failure. But yeah. the reality is you're going to have Tories coming in, which is going to make life worse for ordinary yeah. um, people so in Aotearoa, right? A few different things to kind of unpack in there. Um, one is to understand the different players uh, who are probably going to form government here. So while there has been a swing to the right, it is holding on by a hair. So in order to form a government, you need at least 61 of those 120 seats. Uh, and what we have right now is a base 61 and the potential for them to lose one of those seats uh, with those specials coming in and it probably going to the Greens. So what that means is that there is likely to be a collaboration um, to form a government between uh, the National Party, who would by default collaborate with the ACT Party. So the National Party is like our Liberals. Mm. Uh, and then you have the ACT Party, which is... Uh, Far right in many yeah. respects um, have been really race baiting throughout this election um, through stirring up a lot of misinformation and dissatisfaction uh, about the concept of co-governance, which has existed for you know yeah. decades uh, and actually ironically was initially created through our treaty settlement process under the former national government mm -hmm. uh, and management of local parks and um, uh, other natural assets. So uh, the ACT Party want to, like, for example, cut tens of thousands of uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of jobs in the public service. Uh, they have promised a referendum on Tūrutio Waitangi, the founding document of this country, wow. constitutionally, uh, and a range of other kind of nasty stuff. 
And then you have the New Zealand First Party, uh, who have been in and out of a parliament for decades, uh, led by a guy called Winston Peters, um, who was our former Deputy Prime Minister in the first term of the Jacinda Ardern-led uh, government in 2017 to 2020. Uh, and the only discernible ideology that they have is kind of maybe economic nationalism, like very much 1970s, okay. 1980s thinking, but yep. definitely not anti-capitalist, uh, despite saying, you know, throughout the 2017 formation of government and when they decided to choose um, Jacinda as the prime minister, uh, Winston very famously said that uh, capitalism has lost its human face or something like that. But they've really flirted with um, some quite heinous ideologies throughout this campaign, particularly in the forms of targeting um, our trans and non-binary communities and deciding to make toilets um, one of the key planks of their campaign. Cool. So those are the three groups that are probably going to form government, uh, yet to be seen what it is that they'll actually put forward. But yes, to your point, Tom, um, that poses a real threat to the progress that we've managed to make on climate uh, and definitively to inequality in this country, not the least in the form of housing policy. So they've proposed a range of rollbacks on the slight wins that we managed to gain over the last six years. Um, they want to bring back no cause evictions for renters. Uh, they want to uh, reinstate uh, or roll back the bright line test changes, interest deductibility, and a range of other things, which economists have estimated will mean that if they do that overnight, house prices will go up by 10 to 15 percent, which is one of the <laughs> major drivers of physical and mental health, uh, but also inequality in this country. Uh, <laughs> well, we're well, going to fight them, and that. we've got a great base to fight them from. <laughs> it's not going to happen quietly. That'd be great. I mean, <laughs> look, just before you go, I did want to say the good news is that clearly, you know, you've kept your chin up despite some mm. real really vicious attacks uh, throughout the campaign, <laughs> including I saw there was the one of your uh, candidate core flutes or your, your signs Oof. was graffitied with, you know, the real own of Woke Lesbo, which I really <laughs> yeah. liked. Yeah, that was, that was a funny one. So, um, yeah, here we call them hoardings. I don't know where that terminology oh, okay. comes from. Hoardings, but yeah, our sure. core flutes are our hoardings, our big, yeah. my big face everywhere. Um, so yeah, we had an amazing team. Um, my, I just need a shout out to my Auckland Central team. Like I so stoked. We for real, for real built a community and uh, like my whole thing, the whole time that I've been in politics, like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And also honestly, everything is made up. Like the best yes. that any of us can hope to do is to use the resources that we have, uh, and implement them with our values and, you know, hold ourselves accountable to the people around us. So I, uh, I had this awesome group uh, within our campaign team who were responsible for taking, um, you know, going and fixing vandalized mm. signs and stuff. And I was in the campaign office one day and they brought in a bunch of them. And like, I'm always the guy who's like, I want to see what people are doing. Yeah, yeah. Because I want to know what the vibes are. Like, what, you know, what latest conspiracy is there? Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were like, oh, no, no, no. You know, it's 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 a bit homophobic. And I was like, I really want to know now. Tell me now. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, oh, you know, it says something about, you know, the gays or something. And I was like, okay, cool. Can you go get it for me? And I saw it. And I was like. This is fucking amazing. Like something that I've learned in my time and I've been doing this gig now for six years, which is insane. I turn 30 next year. Like we, I'm no longer the youngest in our parliament, which I'm stoked about. We've got people like Tam Ball and Hunter. It's not your full identity um, anymore. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Not my full identity. I've probably proved myself at this point that I'm no longer the young one. Uh, but yeah, I was like, the one of the things that I've learned is that Nothing actually has power to like embarrass or shame you if you don't give it that power. Mm -hmm. But also yeah. I found it so funny that, yeah, I was like, can you guys take a photo? So I put it on social media uh, and then it became like a big thing. Uh, and yeah, then a uh, local business crushes who um, operate in like vintage New Zealand made stuff uh, hit me up and were like, can we make a shirt? And I was like, yeah, sure, fine. No, we've raised <laughs> thousands of dollars for Rainbow Youth. Um, so, so, yeah. They, like, sold out already, right? right? For Within all days. those little local they Lesbos have. We're out doing there. another run, dropping tonight, actually. Okay, um, all right. Yeah. Well, well, we'll have to put the link in the show notes if anyone <laughs> wants to try and get their hands on one. I actually, I ran as a candidate a few years ago, and a similar thing happened where my campaign manager was like, oh, yeah, we were just fixing up some signs. Like, I don't know if, you know, if you want to see. And I was like, send it through. Um, and mine was that they had like not even over my face but just kind of in the corner written and because my name's Emerald Moon I mean it's a very yeah. you know funny green's name and they had just written I live in a tree <laughs> it's so good you know I, I like that they didn't even really try to go very offensive I'm like yeah. who the fuck doesn't want to live in a tree you know there's a exactly. house of prices like 
He doesn't want to hang out with a work person. Wait, all you can do is laugh, you know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I wish I still had that core flute, actually. Um, (laughs) But look, I think we've probably taken up enough of your time. We should let you go and focus on, you know, inducting all your new friends and teaching them how to be an MP and saving um, the country, saving the world. Yeah. Doing our best. I thank you guys so much for having me and yeah, all the best. I've actually been really, really stoked over the last few years. We've managed to build a really awesome relationship with the Oz Greens and I think that there's a lot that can be learned from continuing to build solidarity uh, and sharing lessons and stuff across the ditch. So thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much for your time, Chloe. Cheers. We'll see you later. Kaki Jet. Koto Kartor, welcome television viewers to the second season of Taskmaster. Our first task is a prize task. The person who brings the best prize will get five points. Tonight, we ask them to bring in what they consider to be the best green thing. Mm, okay. Guy Montgomery, what did you bring in? Well, with due respect to all of the other nine uh, members of the Green Party, I've opted to bring in Chloe Swarbrick. <laughs> Has she consented to this? Yeah, yeah, she's she's here. That's not she's not that big, but she's here. <laughs> so you do realise, Guy, that you meant to bring in the best green thing? Yes. Now even if Chloe was the best thing in the green, but she's number three. Yeah, but that, who do you think does that list? Is James Shaw and Mudman David? Is it's not <laughs> Chloe? <laughs> of course they're one and two. Call to action this week. Please support people in Gaza. As we said, there's a great little kind of compilation of actions that you can take um, compiled by Fahad Ali, standwithpalestine.au, which we put in the show notes. Um, The other thing you can do is donate to the American Near East Refugee Aid, also known as ANIRA, is the acronym. ANIRA.org, A-N-E-R-A.org is the link. We'll put that in the show notes. They deliver uh, you know, have been delivering aid to people in Gaza for many decades and they're saying at the moment they're delivering food and hygiene kits uh, where they can. So please throw some money that way if you can. And there's a petition in here as well um, for the Australian government to retract its support of war crimes committed by Israel against Palestine, which you can sign. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, we also have it's some petition. critical accounts of petitions, but this has gained a level of traction. It's being shared very widely by prominent figures who are standing in solidarity with Palestine. There are 38,000 signatures at this point. It's 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 something, it, if, if you're going to sign any petition, I would say it's definitely this one. Um, so please check it out if you can. On an, another slight side note, just if, out of interest to people who are listening, interested in New Zealand politics, I'd highly recommend this documentary. It's on YouTube. It's for free. It's called Someone Else's Country. I watched it when I was researching my book and it's just this um, amazing investigation of the neoliberal turn that, you know, mm. really hollowed out New, Ze- uh, New Zealand society, the society of the Royal New Zealand. Um, and the you think that our Labour Party was bad in the 80s and 90s, the New Zealand <laughs> Labour Party truly, truly fucked it. And that's a huge reason as to why this so, the inequality is even worse in New Zealand than it is in Australia. Anyway, really fascinating watch if you want to check out someone else's country. Please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening now. Leave us a five-star review. Help get the word out. Tell your friends to listen. Uh, follow us on at Serious Danger AU on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube and TikTok. We post little clips there and teasers and photos. Um, you can find all the links at SeriousDangerPod.com. Please also buy tickets to see our live show in Melbourne let me find the date again. It is celebrating our hundredth <laughs> episode, the 18th of November, 5 p.m. Saturday, the 18th of November at Comedy Republic in Melbourne. T- tickets are $25. We will love you if you come. Check the link in the show notes to buy those. And until next time, look after yourselves and your comrades. Take a break from the phone if you can. Try not to switch off completely. Maintain the hope. Remember, there are people who are fighting for good things. Uh, and solidarity means a lot. And we love you. We love you, work lesbos. Hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> this is a serious danger, Australia.